Sometimes ago, uh, one of the most powerful men on the continent of Africa did say, Africa only talk the talk. We don't walk the talk. And uh, anytime I have anybody on this program, I ask the same question. Are we really walking the talk in Africa, or we only know how to talk the talk? Well, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Trailblazers Africa. My name is Moses Owokwadi. Well, today I'm going to break the protocol. I'm not going to follow uh, the normal routine by giving you some of the news we have uh, on the continent of Africa. Neither will I ask you any question today because my guest is a powerful man. He's a man that um, has seen it all. He's a man, whenever he speaks, everybody listens. And I want to just go for a short one. I want to show his face. And when I show you his face, then I'll formally introduce him. Let's meet my guest. And I'll be back. It's Trailblazers Africa. Welcome back. That was powerful, I must say. Uh, my guest, of course, you've seen him, but you don't know his name because I deliberately told my editor not to put the name yet until I give him the order to do that. So today you're going to see more of that. You're going to hear him more of that. He has a BSc in Electric and uh, Electronic Engineering from the University of Zimbabwe. And uh, his master was also in Engineering and Computer Engineering, PhD in Robotic and uh, Methatronic from the Oxford University, uh, UK. He was the CEO of African Technology and Business Institute before he became the president of Movement for Democratic Change uh, from 2006. And uh, to today, he is still the president of that uh, movement. Presently, he is the deputy prime minister of the Republic of Zimbabwe from 19, I mean, 2009 till date. Well, viewers at home, I have His Excellency Professor Arthur Mutambara, the Deputy Prime Minister of the Republic of Zimbabwe, right with me in the studio. I didn't say outside the studio. You're welcome to Trailblazers Africa. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share with your viewers. Yeah, uh, before we go into the larger, you know, frame of Africa, let me take you back home, Zimbabwe. Hi, hi Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe is doing very well. What we have done in the country is to come up with an inclusive government, a coalition government of the three major political parties. Why? Because our last election was inconclusive. Our last election was challenged by the losers, which means we had a problem. So we decided to work together with South Africa and SADAC to come up with an inclusive government whose mandate is to reform our politics. Mm. A new constitution, electoral reforms, political reforms, uh, national healing, economic reforms, aligning our security sector to democracy so that come next election, our elections will be free and fair. Those who are going to lose those elections will congratulate the winners and the winners will form a democratic government. So we are doing very well in so far as reforming our politics so that next time around we're going to deliver one winner, which winner will then form a democratic government. So we're moving on and making progress. Yeah, the, the, the formation of the national unity government is one uh, big plus uh, to some African country. But can we really say that has really helped us in a way? There are positives and negatives. Okay. The positive side is to say, work together across the political divide, form one government involving different political parties, reform your politics together, and then come up with 
a situation that will lead to a free and fair election. Mm -hmm. That is the good side in Kenya. That is the good side in Zimbabwe, where these parties work together to reform the politics of the country and then allow for freeness and fairness of our elections so that we can have one winner. The downside is that if we are not careful in Africa, you encourage losers to cling on to power. You encourage losers to say, I wasn't defeated, and then foster and force coalitions. So in the long run in Africa, we should not be having coalition governments like we have in Kenya and Zimbabwe. They're bad for democracy. When we go for elections, there must be clear winners and clear losers. Those who have lost must give up power and allow the winners to form a new government. So that is the negative side, mm. where sometimes when they see Zimbabwe, when they see Kenya, you saw what happened in Cote d'Ivoire, that someone was trying to stick around. Yeah. So we want to make sure that it is not the way we run the affairs of our nations in Africa. Mm. They are, um, you know a compromise solution, a sub-optimal solution to a difficult situation. In the long run, we should not be having this. Mm. So those are the positives and negatives of a coalition government, of a power-sharing arrangement. Mm. It has worked well for Kenya. Okay. It has worked well for Zimbabwe. But it should not be the solution for Africa. Well, it shouldn't be the solution to African politics and uh, governance. But l let's look at the political differences. How... Uh, from this party, the other party, coming together to form a national unity, you know, uh, government. Uh, would, would, would the goal be one? This is the message I've brought today to Ghana. Okay. We are saying to African countries and African people, in a country, let us craft a national constitution that we all defend, number one. Let us craft a national vision, the destination of the country, where do we want Ghana to be in 2040? Mm. The NPP, NDC, CPP, and the others must have the same destination. Okay. They must have the same shared mm. national vision. The national brand, what are we known for in terms of tourism, trade, investment, people, governance, culture, what we call the hexagon of branding. The people of Ghana must have the same national brand. Yeah. Once we have these shared frameworks, the national interest, the national interest in Zimbabwe must be shared by all political parties. The national interest in Ghana must be shared by all political parties. If we have those things as shared, national interest, national vision, national brand, national constitution, then when you have a power sharing arrangement, then you are in the same direction. When you have a winner-takes-all situation where a party wins an election and forms a government, again, we move in the same direction. If we achieve what I'm talking about, in this country, I know you're going to elections in Ghana. It won't matter whether NDC wins or NPP wins. Why? Because there are grand canons, there are fundamental issues and frameworks mm. which are shared by everyone. Just like in America, when we say the American Constitution, when you say the American dream, when you say the American national interest, when you say the American foreign policy objective, Democrat, Republican, liberal, whoever you are in America, they share all those things. Mm. The issue in America is I'm a better defender of the Constitution than you are. The issue in America are I'm a better deliver, I can deliver the American dream to more Americans than you are. Mm. I can defend American national interest better than you are. In other words, they don't question those fundamentals. We want that in Zimbabwe. So the African state must have shared frameworks mm -hmm. which parties don't challenge. Consequently, it won't matter when party A gets into power, party B comes in because the general direction remains the same. Mm -hmm. This is what we need in Africa. And that will be a framework that will save us well under power sharing arrangement, will save us well when one party gets into power and that party is taken out, we move. Well, uh, on, on the program today, I will be talking more of uh, politics because uh, this is one area that can keep, uh, that can make or mar uh, our nation. And if the politics is wrong, the economy is wrong. If the government is also bad, you can be sure that there is nothing that will move forward uh, in that country. I, I want to uh, go by your statement. I, I was going through some of your statements in the past. I you said... Africans, we don't walk the talk. We only talk the talk. 
uh, how would you be able to make Africa to walk the talk that you are sharing? Because mm. this is, you, permit me to say, you are towing the line of the, the, the likes of late Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who admired, who preached, who wanted united Africa. So how do we walk the talk mm. in Africa? Let me start by making sure we understand the charge against Africa and Africans. Africans are very good dreamers. Africans are very good planners. Africans are very good talkers. We are very thin on execution. We are very thin on doing things. Mm. What we're saying is, yes, let us have our visions. Let us have our plans. Let us have our economic blueprints. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating. We must put our money where our mouth is. We must walk the talk. Meaning, if you are not doing things in Ghana, then you have no strategy. Execution is strategy. Mm. A dream without execution is meaningless. Let us make sure that we do things, we do them expeditiously, and we measure things. That's another dimension. Yeah. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So first, we must have the discipline of doing things, the discipline of execution, the discipline of the speed of execution. But more importantly, the things we do must be measured, must be monitored, so that you can then feed back and say, I'm doing okay, I'm going to keep doing the same thing. Who monitors, I'm doing, I'm who monitors I'm doing, that? I'm doing badly, I must change course. We monitor ourselves. We put systems in place to okay. monitor programs. We put systems in place to monitor effectiveness of programs. Not only that, others monitor. There are about five indices. The World Economic Forum, World Bank, Mo Ibrahim. Don't complain that I don't like these numbers. For example, Ghana right now is number 114, 114 out of 142. Zimbabwe is number 136 out of 142. The number one country in the world is Switzerland. Number two is Singapore. Number three is Sweden. Yeah, this is the World Economic Forum Global Competitive Index. Now, mm. it's one way of measuring, but I'm saying Africans must pay attention to measurement. If you don't like the measurements, come up with your own. Mo Ibrahim has done his own measurement on governance. I am emphasizing that. Yes, let us plan. Yes, let us dream. But let us encourage our people to implement and have the discipline of doing things. Once we've done that, we must monitor and measure success so that we can feed back into our system and correct our own activities. I think we are trying as African leaders, but we must do more of execution. A dream without execution is better not to have been dreamed about it at all because without execution, whatever plan, whatever program you have put on paper is just a waste of time. But there's one major problem that all over the world uh, they keep talking about Africa, and that is corruption. Mm -hmm. now, yeah, before we come to this corruption, let's mm -hmm. talk about Krumah. See, Krumah yeah. spoke in 57 and uh, said, the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it is linked to the independence of the rest of Africa. Court number one. Court number two, he said in 1960, in the Constitution, we as Ghanaians are prepared to surrender our sovereignty in part or in total in pursuit of African unity. Now, my charge to Africans is we didn't listen to Krumah. The Europeans did. Now they have the EU working. The African Union is to not there. The, Afri the United States of Africa is not there. Now, here, here was a dream, a good dream by Krumah. Mm. Uh, Senghor, Ben Bela, Sokoto, Nyerere. But the Africans, 55 years later, are still dreaming. The Europeans plagiarized Krumah. They never acknowledged, and they've implemented. Now we have the EU working. Now I'm saying... Why don't we listen to our prophets and do more than listening and execute and implement that agenda? Right now we have an extra country, Southern Sudan. There are now 54 countries. We are growing the number of African countries. We don't need 54 countries. We need one country. India, In Africa. India is 1.2 billion people, one president. China is 1.3 billion people, one president. Why do we need 54 presidents? Two million people and you have a president. 10 million people, a president, 20. She can change. Under globalization, success is a function of regional integration. Success is a function of continental integration. If we were to go to the world and say, here is Africa, a billion Africans in one economy working together, 
then we're going to compete with the Chinese effectively. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to make sense to the Chinese effectively. We're going to talk to Angle Sam, the Americans. They're going to listen to us because a market of a billion Africans is attractive. We're going to compete with India. So we go to walk the talk. But what it means is we must give up on these titles. Prime Minister of 50 million people. President of 30 million people. We must President of 2 million people. That's nonsense. So we're saying in Ghana, for example, <laughs> in these elections in Ghana, why don't we say we are fighting to provide the Minister of Finance for ECOWAS? Okay? In Nigeria, they are fighting to pro provide the Minister of Agriculture. What I'm saying is give up Ghana on the notion of a president. Now, Give up Zimbabwe on the notion of a president. But let's come to corruption. You talked about no, corruption. No, no, no. I, I, I will take you back to corruption because okay. this, this, the, I'd wanted to postpone this to okay. the latter part of the okay. program. But now that you have touched on it, uh. Uh, Nkrumah's vision was a united Africa. But I may be wrong. Uh, how about the national sovereignty? How about my sovereignty uh. as a country? Now, you are from Zimbabwe. Yeah, I want to speak, I'll speak I, to I, I'm from Ghana. Yeah then if I come together and we have a one president, have I not subject myself to the leadership of that one president mm. at the expense of my people? Let's, this is a very good question. Yeah. Africans must redefine the meaning of national sovereignty. Africans must be prepared to give up certain aspects of national sovereignty to embrace what we call regional sovereignty. Africans must be prepared to give up on certain aspects of national sovereignty in order to in embrace continental sovereignty. And Krumah got it in 1960. And I'll quote again. We as Ghanaians are prepared to surrender our sovereignty in part or in total in pursuit of African unity. Why are you so engrossed in sovereignty to your two million people, sovereignty of your uh, 10 million people, when the success, when the power is in a billion Africans. Yes, there is no such thing as a free lunch. All good things come at a cost. We like the numbers. We like the economics. We like a better quality of life in the block, Equus, in the block, Sadak in the African United Economy. Mm. But that comes at a price. The price is there will be no president around here. There will be one president in the entire continent and a few chiefs. What's wrong with that if people are going to do better? Your so what do I say? Give up, give up on your ego as an African. Your Excellency, I, I don't know whether you are aware of the fight that almost uh, you know, came up at the election of the AU. The last time they were choosing yeah, yeah, the chairman yeah. of the AU, mm -hmm. it was... Big, in fact, it almost created a big problem between South Africa and Nigeria. And it was leading to economic, you know, problem, diplomatic problem. Uh, is it because we are not ready to surrender our national ego yeah. or our interest for Africa? We only say it, but we don't mean it. This is why the topic for my discussion at the democracy lecture yeah. was building a peaceful democratic, non-partisan, and prosperous African state. Understanding where African leaders have gotten it wrong. African leaders are not ready mm -hmm. to build a united Africa. African leaders don't understand what it will take to integrate Africa. African leaders have not understood Kwame Krumah, Ben Bala, Senghor, and Nyerere. African leaders are caught up on provincialism. They're caught up on nationalism. African leaders haven't understood that. Under globalization, you won't make it as a nation of 2 million people. You won't make it as a nation of 50 million people. South Africa has not understood that you can't be a member of the BRICS with a GDP of 50 billion people, or 50 billion dollars. You're too small to be a BRICS. If you look at Brazil, look at Russia, look at India and China, it's a misnomer for South Africa to be a brick. What South Africa needs to do is to go there as Sadak. In Sadak, we have 250 million people. What South Africa needs to do is to go as Comesa, where we have 400 million people. What South Africa should do is to go to the BRICS as the FTA, where there are 600 million people. What South Africa should do is to go to the BRICS as the African continent with a billion people. Then you'll be a brick. Then you can compare and talk business with China. 
talk business with India. Right now, South Africa is too small to be a brick. I know they're my brothers, I love them. But I'm saying psychologically, the African leader does not understand what it takes to play the game under globalization. So no. the issues you raise at that meeting of the AU mm. is a manifestation of the lack of clarity, a manifestation of Francophone versus Anglophone. How do you even describe yourself using your master's language? Why are you Anglophone? Why are you Francophone? You're being told what to do by Sarkozy or by Cameroon or by Anglo-Sam the Americans. We want Africans who do make decisions on behalf of Africa, on instructions of Africa. Don't listen to Obama and America. Don't listen to Sarkozy and France. Don't listen to Britain. Listen to the African cause. The Africans on the continent are easily bribed because when you do bilateral with Sarkozy as a country, mm. you are very small, you can be compromised. When you do a bilateral with Cameron in Britain as a country, you are small, you can be compromised. But when you negotiate as a billion people working together, you are much stronger, you get a better deal than when you go bilateral. Let's swing it to China. Again, mistake. China is 1.3 billion people. China is a huge economy. You find Ghana cutting a deal with China. You get screwed. You find Zimbabwe cutting a deal with China. You get outgunned. You find Nigeria cutting a deal with China. No, 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 no. Let's not go as individual countries to China. Why let's don't come you, together. Let's, let's go as ECOWAS. We okay. negotiate a better deal. Let's go as SADAC. We negotiate a better deal. Let us go as the AU. Can you imagine when you sit down with the Chinese and say, look here, let's talk here. I have a market of a billion people. I have gold in Ghana, I have platinum in Zimbabwe, I have diamonds in Zimbabwe, I have... Petroleum in Nigeria? Then they can now negotiate with you on a fair basis, and the Africans can extract a better deal, a better understanding. Well, viewers, I have been speaking with His Excellency, the Prime Minister of uh, Zimbabwe, Professor Arthur uh, Mutambara. He's my guest on Trailblazers Africa, and today we'll be looking at... Um, Africa, what can really move African forward economically, politically, and uh, socially? This program, uh, the, the chairman of this organization said it could lapse for more than one hour. So uh, I want to tell you that you have enough time with me on today's episode of uh, Trailblazers Africa. It's a special one uh, because of how important the issue is. Um, you, you, you talk about the break that South Africa was only last week. It's a, it's, 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 o only last it's, week. There was a meeting, and the Minister of Finance of South Africa assured that the BRIC, that they are even donating, uh, that they will contribute to ensure that it works fine. Now, looking at... No, 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 no. What we're saying is, making South Africa a BRIC is purely political. It's about political correctness. In <laughs> terms of economics, size of economy, size of population, look at Brazil, look at Russia, look at China, look at India. They don't qualify. I am saying they will qualify when they are there as SADC or representing SADC. They will qualify if they go there as Comesa. They will qualify if they understand that they need scale. I want my brothers to be in the BRICS, but I want them to be an effective BRIC. And the way you become an effective BRIC is to bring is, scale. You mean that we need number? Number. Now, talking about number, um, I want to take West Africa uh -huh. as an example. That is ECOWAS and, of course, SADC. Now, even movement of trade within this country is a difficult sure. task. Now, since there is no regional uh, interest, we still keep our national sovereignty, national interest. I have seen a, a conflict between the national interest and regional interest now, and national interest appears to be prevailing. How can we check it? How can we move forward? There should be no conflict between the national interest and the regional interest. Mm -hmm. If you craft the regional interest correctly, there should be no conflict between the national interest and the continental interest if you craft the continental interest correctly. More importantly, if you have the right people negotiating, right now you have a bunch of chiefs who are drunk with power, mm. who want to remain as presidents, who want to remain as prime ministers. We are asking them to go and negotiate a suicide. We are asking them to negotiate their execution 
their removal from office. What I'm saying is that's why I'm emphasizing that our African leaders must come to terms with the notion that you don't have to be a president, okay? The president can be rotating in Ghana this year, in five years in Malawi, in Tunisia, you have a minister. Psychologically, we mm. must understand that what is important is the quality of life of our people. What is important is the economics, not the ego. Mm. Now, why are we pushing? We're pushing this because we want to improve the quality of life of our people. The economics must get better. And when we do regional integration, there should be no conflict between the nation state and, 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 and the continent. Now, ECOWAS, when the block is working, it means you can collectivize your economics. Mm. Why you are saying there's a problem? We have not carried out what we call intra-Africa investment, intra-Africa trade. There must be trade among ECOWAS countries. There must be investment between Nigeria and Ghana. Ghanaians investing in Nigeria. Nigerians investing in Ghana. In SEDAC, we must have Zimbabweans investing in South Africa. South Africans investing in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. Intra-SADAC investment. Intra-ECOWAS investment. But more importantly, intra-Africa trade. Intra-Africa investment. Right now, there's no infrastructure promoting this. You need roads telecoms, ICT, water, electricity, railway network. Regional infrastructure to promote mm -hmm. intra-Africa trade. Regional infrastructure to promote intra-Africa investment. We must build infrastructure to promote trade among ourselves. And then once we trade among ourselves, then we can then trade with outside as a block. What we're doing is we're, we're trading from Ghana to London, Zimbabwe to London, Lagos to America. Yeah? Whereas we're not promoting the trade within the continent. Once we trade among ourselves, then we face the world as a block. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying, sir. Uh, and and uh, when you do that, the per capita income of our people will go up. When you do that, the gene coefficient will be a better number for ourselves. Now, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm, I'm going to that. How do, we, how do we then manage the GDP? which has been the major challenge of many nations mm -hmm, now. Mm -hmm. Now, if we come together as one country, mm -hmm. how can Ghana say, well, this is my uh, yearly income, as uh, it were. Uh, how will, uh, you know, you, you understand no, what I'm saying? Here's the problem. Why, why do you even need to do that? This is, this is, you are using <laughs> the wrong tools. In America, they talk about the American GDP. You don't have Georgia saying, this is my contribution as GDP uh, as Georgia. You don't have California saying, I contribute this so much. You don't have Texas. You have the American economy as the American GDP. You have the Chinese GDP. GDP. You have the Indian GDP. So you should not even worry about, about the Ghanaian GDP. GDP. What is important is what is the quality of life of the Ghanaian person? How is the Zimbabwean person doing? And by the way, GDP is also a very flawed number. Because it doesn't tell us about the quality of life of the people. So first and foremost, I'm saying there's no need to talk about Ghana's GDP if we're mm the United States of Africa. Uh, but but uh, I, want, I want to attack GDP as a number and say okay. we want to talk about per capita income. It's a yeah. better number. Because it talks about the average for each person. We must talk about what's called the Gini coefficient, which is the measure of disparities between the rich and the poor. And the poor That's yeah. a better number. There's another number now we're pushing called Global Happiness Index. What does that mean? I have not heard that. Are the Ghanaians happy? Are the people from Tunisia happy? Are the South Africans happy? Measure happiness of a person. And Bhutan, a small country, has done some good measures. So it's called Global Happiness Index. Let's Global measure that. Happiness. Yeah, G uh, G <laughs> GHI, Global Happiness Index. The second one is called the Planet Happiness Index. Is the planet happy? What are we talking about now? We're saying it's not enough for people to be happy. We must consider the climate change agenda, the mm. environmental agenda. Are mm. the frogs in Ghana happy? Are the elephants in Zimbabwe happy? How about the grass? What about the water? Meaning... Success must speak in terms of profits, economics, community, the people, and, the and environment. environment. So in Ghana, I want to come back here and have a discussion about the Planet Happiness Index. We <laughs> must be very sophisticated in the way we measure success. Success must speak to per capita income, must speak to the gene coefficient, must speak to the Global Happiness Index, must speak to the planet happiness index then can we then say we can measure the sources of a nation by the gdp is the gdp it's, a, uh, it's, 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 it's not sufficient you want gdp you want per capita income you want gene coefficient you want the uh, global happiness index mm. you want the planet happiness index it's just one number but very 
very meaningless. Mm. We, why are we saying this? Economic growth must be shared. Economic growth must be inclusive. When you look at the number, without talking about whether it's shared, it, does the woman in Kumasi experience the economic growth? Does the woman in the Cape Coast experience the growth? The person in Soweto, South Africa has got a very big GDP. How about those people in the ghettos of Soweto? Are they experiencing that GDP of uh, 357 billion dollars? No, of course they are not. So when you look at the gene coefficient in South Africa, when you look at uh, per capita income, then you see South Africa is very underdeveloped. Blacks are not doing well in South Africa. Well, we, we, we go for this short break, and uh, the break we are going is to meet His Excellency again on the stage where he was delivering this paper. And that was where uh, Trailblazers Africa caught up with him and asked him to please pass by the studio before leaving for Zimbabwe. So let's go back to uh, the O. Oh, I think it, this was at the International Conference Center here in Accra, in Accra, Ghana. If you are watching this program across the world, this is a statement of His Excellency Professor Arthur Mutambara, the Deputy Prime Minister of the Republic of Zimbabwe. And when I come back, we'll still continue with so many questions on how we can move Africa forward. I'll be back. I'm just happy to be in Ghana, the citadel, the foundation of liberation. I'm just happy to be in Ghana, the origin of the African struggles. Why a democracy lecture? Why this topic? Building a peaceful, non-partisan, democratic and prosperous African state. And why do it in Ghana? Number one, Ghana has been the front runner. Ghana has been the leader from the beginning. 1957, the first African country to achieve independence. So, we are here to respect that superstardom of Ghana. Ghana has had 55 years since 1957. 16 years of that before 1992, 16 years of democratic governance, 19 years of military rule, then 20 years of continuous democratic rule. That is the breakdown of the 55 years for Ghana. Again, you can see that Ghana has been the front runner in terms of reforming African regimes, moving away from military rulers to democracy, 1992 to now. Ghana has been the leader, 20 years continuous in terms of democratic governance. That's why I'm in Ghana. That's why we're having a Pan-African democracy lecture in Accra. That's why I'm here. Now, let me make sure I clarify this topic. Building a peaceful, non-partisan, democratic and prosperous African state. Understanding where African leaders have gotten it wrong. I am here to pick up lessons. I am here to identify where we have gotten it wrong as African leaders. By the way, by African leaders, I include myself. By African leaders, I include Zimbabwe. And when I say African leaders have gotten it wrong, I'm not implying that European leaders have gotten it right. I'm not implying that Europeans have gotten it right. Rather, I'm saying I'm interested in what African leaders have gotten wrong and what they can do about it. Welcome back. It's interesting. I tell you, I told you today is uh, call it fire for fire. You may be right, but this is passion for African development. Now, one major area you touched that, you know, uh, really created a kind of serious thought in me is that Africa, we take our raw materials, our raw product resources to other parts of the world, then we bring them back refined at more cost than we are giving it out. What is actually wrong with us? Let us understand this. There are so many natural resources in Africa. I think Ghana, 40% of world gold or something like that. Zimbabwe and South Africa, 90% of world platinum. Zimbabwe on its own, 25% of world diamonds. 
oil, Nigeria, and so on. We are massively endowed in terms of natural resources. Another illustration, all the people in the world, the 6 billion people we have in the world, they can all live in the DRC, leverage the resources in the DRC, and have a better quality of life than they are experiencing right now. Hmm. I'm dramatizing the massive nature of our natural resources. Why are we not rich? Why are we poor when we are sitting on these natural resources? Count number one, we are not leveraging our natural resources to drive our economies. We do not own our natural resources. We have a company in Ghana that discovers oil and then owns it. Mm -hmm. And then they give us 13%. That's, <laughs> a trav that's a travesty of justice. Because you've discovered a natural resource, it doesn't make it yours. David Livingstone discovered the Victoria Falls. He, it doesn't make it his. Some Europeans discovered the pyramids. It doesn't make it theirs. When a speculator discovers platinum, it doesn't make it theirs. What we're saying, message number one, Africans must start quantifying their geology, understanding what they have underground, and put a number to that asset and mind. Before you take the rock from the ground, it has value. Before you discover the oil in Ghana, it had value. What is the value? So we have not done that as Africans. The platinum in Zimbabwe in the Great Dyke, unmined, is $52 billion. Unmined, undiscovered, has value. The gold in Ghana, before someone discovers it, has value. Let's put a number, $14 billion. So when someone comes and discovers, we say, okay, pay us the value of the oil is $14 billion. That's the value of the oil before you discovered it. We have not done that in the DRC. Mm. So all the mining laws in Africa are criminal. They must be reformed. All the mining laws in Ghana, the laws around oil, are a travesty of justice in Ghana. Mm. We must change our laws so that the natural resources in Zimbabwe are benefiting Zimbabweans. Count number two. We are taking these raw materials from our countries and churning them out of the country unprocessed. Yeah? We are producing what we don't consume and consuming what we don't produce. Why don't we add value to gold before we sell it? Why don't we add value to platinum before we sell it? Why don't you add value to diamonds before we sell it? Meaning, let us cut our diamonds in Zimbabwe, hmm? process our diamonds, and build jewelry. So we sell jewelry to Israel, to America, to the Chinese. Jewelry. Platinum. Let's process our platinum in Zimbabwe and develop what are called catalytic converters, which are used in cars. We sell catalytic converters. That's what mm. they use. Pl platinum is used for catalytic converters. Yeah. Then we sell these refined products to ourselves, to Ghana, to China, to America. Mm. The same applies to gold. The same applies to petroleum. But your we, we must refine our petroleum in Nigeria. So we sell petrol, we sell diesel to America and Europe. Now, once we do that, then we'll be able to unlock value from natural resources to our people. Otherwise, if we don't do that, we have what's called the resource case, where the resources are not a blessing, the resources are a case. And also ownership. The Ghanaians must own the commanding heights of the economy in Ghana. The petroleum company in Ghana must be owned by Ghanaians. The gold companies must be owned by Ghanaians. We don't want to survive on taxes and royalties. I'm sick and tired of that. We we'll pay taxes, we we'll pay royalties, we want dividends. Mm -hmm. You know, you must understand the notion of ownership. Ownership is foreign to a slave. Ownership is alien to an enslaved person. Mm -hmm. Ownership is alien to a colonized person. Mm -hmm. That's why Africans sometimes are afraid to own, because they're supposed to be owned by somebody else. And don't tell me that you got your freedom in 1955, or in 19, sorry, 1957, or 1980 for Zimbabwe, or 1994 for South Africa. What we got in 1957 here was physical freedom. What we got in Zimbabwe was physical independence. What about mental independence? The most powerful weapon of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Decolonizing the mind is a very difficult exercise. There are many Ghanaians who are walking around as enslaved people. There are many Ghanaians who are walking around as colonized people. The same applies to South Africans and Zimbabweans. Don't take for granted decolonization of the mind. Are you an independent person mentally? Are you ready to own the economy and employ white people? 
Let, I, I that, like that, is, that is the psychology we're pushing now. Africans must be...